get calls all the time at work. And all kinds of questions. One of the most common questions is, I have all this stains on my shower built up over time. How can I get them off? And to which I respond is, I think it's time to get a new shower. They're not too thrilled about that because of the cost, but they say, well, isn't there some chemicals that you can just put on there and it will come off? Well, try a little elbow grease. Try that chemical and see how that works. And typically they will try some different sort of chemicals and still yet it doesn't come off. It's still there. As it builds up over time, there's really a lot of times not much you can do. And so they have these stains that are stuck there and which eventually they will want to come back and put a smile on my face. They'll say, okay, we want to buy a new shower. You're welcome. And that's the thing with sin. We could try all we want to get rid of it, but no matter what, guess what? It's still there. There's nothing we can do to get rid of it. We can try all the good works that we think that we can do, and guess what? It doesn't knock off a single one. It's only what Christ has done, his sacrifice, his body broken, his blood shed for the atonement of our sin, and that we have the grace through him that makes us clean. The only chemical that can wash that away is his blood. And that's what it did. And through that, in our faith in him, and our deciding to follow him, to be baptized in him, and put on him in, through that watery grave, we become his children and become clean. And because of that, we can take part of this communion together. But as his children, that means we need to act like it as well. That means that we just don't get to walk every day and keep on sinning and do whatever we want. It means that when we've put him on, that we change as well and that we choose to follow his ways and no longer our own. And that's also a part of this reminder because of what he's done for us, that we're also going to choose to follow his ways and not our own selfish ways. Keep all these things in mind as we pray together and thank God for sending his son and for the sacrifice we have through him. Let's bow together. Holy God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his sacrifice, for his body broken for us on the cross and his blood that was shed that washes away our sin. We're grateful for all that you continue to do for us as well. But most of all, God, we thank you right now for his life, his death, his example for us. And it's through Christ we all pray together. Amen. Let's continue and give thanks for the blood that was shed that covers our sin. Again, Holy Father, we thank you for being our King. And because of that, we bow before you. And we give you all honor and respect and love that you are due. Father, we ask that we will follow your ways. That we don't take this time lightly as we remember the sacrifice of what you've given to us. We thank you again for the blood that was shed for us that we can have grace through you. Through your son's most powerful blood and son's name we pray, amen.
Separate from the Lord's Supper, we take a time to stop and just give thanks. That we say thank you again to our great God for all the great gifts that he's bestowed upon us. We can stop and thank him for this time that we can share together. That we want to stop and give thanks. That we live in a country that we can do that without persecution. And we can stop and just give thanks that we're living in a time in our country that's in peace. And we pray for those that are not. But let's stop and just give thanks for all that he's done for us. And if you'd like to give, you can do so, whether it be online through the Tithely app or there's baskets in the back of the auditorium you can give after service is over. Let's though stop and let's just stop and just say thank you to our God for all the great things he continues to bestow upon us. Let's bow, please. Oh, Father in heaven, we just want to stop and give thanks. You are such a great and giving God. We thank you for the mercy you continually show us. We thank you for the grace that we have through your son. We thank you for the country that we were born in and that we get to live in, that we can just uh, say thank you for continually showing us uh, so many good gifts, that we can worship you, that we can praise your name without persecution. We pray for those that are in other parts of the world that aren't, don't have that freedom. And Father, we just uh, thank you for the love that you show us. We pray that you will bestow your love and your peace upon those that are in war right now. And we pray for that will stop soon. God, again, we want to thank you for your son and the gift that we have through him. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Let's be smiling, or smiling. Let's be smiling and standing. How about that? <laughs> Say amen if God has smiled on you. Oh, just three of you. Good job. <laughs> God has smiled on me. He has set me free. God has smiled on me, he's been good to me. Dark clouds rolled away, sunshine now on me. God has smiled on me, he's been good. To me, be seated, please. All right, good morning. We are almost done with our series on searching for the will of God in our lives. So I want to refresh our memories because. We've only been in this series for eight weeks, so maybe we've forgotten a few things over the course of time. I want us to remember that we are not talking about moral choices. As we're going through this series and trying to figure out what does God want for me to do, we're not trying to determine whether or not God wants us to do the right thing or the wrong thing, right? We know that God always wants us to do the right thing. Instead, we're talking about all those other times in life where things are just always, they, seem, they are seemingly not so clear where we just don't really know exactly what we're supposed to do or what decision we're supposed to make or what step we're supposed to take, where everything seems a little less clear than should I shoplift or not, right? Should I be angry at that person and curse them out because the line at the grocery store is not moving fast enough or should I not? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, I've got two or three job choices, and I don't know which way to go. I had a friend of mine reach out to me three days ago and said, hey, I've got a job offer in San Diego. I live up in Bakersfield. I also have a job offer up here. He's like, what do you think? They're offering me this here. They're offering me that there. What do you think the best choice is for me? Because he doesn't know what step to take or what the next move is. And so 
He wants some advice. He doesn't want to do it incorrectly. And so we've been on this series of searching for the will of God for a long time. But this morning, I want to focus on searching for the will of a good God. Now, you might think, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is whether or not you actually believe and trust that God is good or not. So as we've been going through, we we went through a lot of Old Testament stories and we determined that the Old Testament is weird. Do you remember? We determined the Old Testament is very weird, whether it's Moses being called to bring the Israelites out of Egypt and Moses saying, God, I'm I'm not sure I'm the right guy. And he kind of wants some signs from God, right? God, show me that I actually am supposed to do this. And he says, take the staff in your hand and throw it down and it turns into a snake. And he grabs it by the tail and picks it back up. It turns into a staff again. And the whole thing with the hand being leprous when he puts it in the cloak and pulls it back out and it turns clean again. All those strange stories were like, that is just weird. That's not my daily occurrence. Or do you remember when when King Saul, we got the little bit of honey here on the stick. Remember when King Saul believed that his entire army had been cursed by God because, well, some men were eating meat with blood still in it they didn't cook it and and jonathan well he had eaten honey and and saul had forbidden them to eat anything while the battle was going on and he was sure that they had been cursed by god and then the whole story ends with them really not knowing exactly what happened and they just all went home it's weird stories or the use of the urim and the thummim as we talked about the high priest and his breastplate and how do we know what god wants us to do well we ask a question and then we pull out the stones to find the answer right it's like that's just strange or gideon when he sets out the fleece and says god are you sure you want me to go against the midianites are you sure this is what you want me to do he says i have an idea i have an idea i'll set down a test now i know some of you have done this i know i say well the old testament is weird but i know some of you have done this You've set up your own fleece of sorts, either flipping a coin or doing something and saying, I don't know what to do. So, God, if I get if I flip a coin, I get heads three times in a row, then I know you want me to go over here. And if it comes up tails three times in a row, then I know you want me to go that direction. If it doesn't come up either, then I will do something else until I get an answer that seems to me to be a clear one. Well, that's Gideon. God almost set out a fleece. I wanted to be moist underneath and dry on the fleece and that's what it was he says okay god i need another sign because well that might have just happened so do the opposite next time make the fleece wet and make the ground dry beneath it and he does that and then gideon says okay i i think i got it i think i've heard from god so that's the whole proposition is a little weird especially in the old testament but then we looked at the new testament the book of acts And we looked at the use of of scripture and how Peter used the scriptures and prayers and togetherness and how they replaced Judas, that empty seat at the table, right? And he pulls from Psalm 69, he pulls from Psalm 109, he takes two passages that are seemingly unrelated and he, he puts them together and says, this is how we know we need to replace Judas. And then they cast lots to figure out which of the two candidates they should choose. And it all sounds very bizarre. And we looked at how later on in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, how Peter was on his way to go see Cornelius and how he had to overcome some previous understandings that he had had that were based on Scripture. And how the Holy Spirit had come down and had done some strange, strange activities that had to be explained through their experience. And so we say, well, the New Testament's also kind of weird. We looked at the story of Paul last week where paul is convinced in his spirit actually says he is compelled by the spirit of god to go to jerusalem but on his way to jerusalem he is met by people who speak through the spirit of god and tell him not to go and the whole pursuit actually might seem a little bit weird the whole thing might seem a little bit strange to us as we're going through this And I think through the process, sometimes we wonder, well, what exactly am I supposed to do then? Right? Like, well, what are you saying, Rob? Like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to set up tests? Right? Am I supposed to do these things? Am I supposed to look for signs that say, go this way? Look for signs that say, no, go that way. And to me, I think the real question is, 
Why are we looking for signs? Why are you looking for a sign to figure out what you're supposed to do? Why? Why is it when we have a decision to make, we say, God, show me a sign? I'm going to flip a coin. I'm going to draw straws. I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. And in that activity, I want you to reveal to me what it is exactly you want me to do. Why do we do that? I know. I wish I had an answer. Because we are afraid. We're afraid to jump because, truth be told, we're not entirely certain there's anything on the other side to land on. And so we're scared. We're scared we'll do it wrong. We're scared we'll make a choice and it'll be the wrong choice. Not morally wrong, but it won't be the pleasant thing. Right? We'll do, we'll make a choice. We'll take that job. We'll marry that person. We'll move over here. We'll do this. We'll go to that college. We'll do these things. And we're afraid that it won't turn out the way that we want. That it won't be pleasant. That it might be a, an unpleasant experience. Which I find to be a bit curious because no matter what you do in life, you are bound to have unpleasant experiences, whatever it is that you do. No matter what choice you make, it's bound to happen. You will have an unpleasant experience. And so we're afraid. But I think our fear is actually deeper than things won't go the way that we want. I think we fear that God is not good all the time. Now, I know we have Perry. He's the God is good all the time cheerleader. But deep down, we're afraid if we make that choice, maybe just maybe God won't be good to me in that path. I think that's our deepest fear. It's not so much that we're afraid we'll get it wrong or we'll have an unpleasant experience. It's that God, show me the right path. Is it this school or that school or this choice or that choice? Because I know if I pick the wrong one, maybe you won't be good to me if I go that way. So show me the right path because then I know you'll be good to me on that path. But you do not have to convince a good God to be good. Because he's already good. Is already good. So let's take a look. And I know we, I've already gone through these when we went through the Gospel of Matthew, but there's something about the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew that I think really speak to this, this truth that it's hard for us to accept. We mentally accept it. And when Perry says, God is good, and we say all the time, he says all the time, and you say, we believe it when we say it, but When we have a hard choice, suddenly we need to remind ourselves and believe that God is good no matter what we choose. Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 1. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. I'm going to say this multiple times as we go through this, just so it's clear. The reason you practice your piety in front of others is because you don't believe God is going to bless you. So you need people to see it so they bless you instead. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. The reason you want other people to see the good works that you do is so that they can compliment you and praise you for the good works that you do. Because otherwise, if they don't do it, well, who's going to do it? And Jesus says, well, God will do it. Isn't that enough? Yeah, but what if he doesn't? 
What if he doesn't? I need to make sure someone is giving me credit for the work I perform. And I will tell you, this is something that was ingrained in me in sales. That any time I did something that was above and beyond for my customer, we were told, now make sure they know that you did that. Because otherwise, they won't reward you for the good work that you did because they don't know you did it. So make sure you tell them all the aboves and beyonds that you did. But we do that because maybe deep down we don't really think God's going to see it. So somebody needs to see it. Otherwise, how would we get praised? How would we be thanked? How would we be told what a great job we did unless somebody sees it? But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. What he's really saying is, do you believe God is good? And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand up and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. The reason you do all those things in public is because you don't believe God will bless you in private. Because maybe he's not good after all. And so I better get something out of all this. And so I do it in front of everyone so that everyone can see. And they can bless me instead of God. Because maybe God won't. But they might. Because they're watching. But Jesus says, but whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. I think this is super applicable to us today. Talk about trying to convince God that he is good and should do the good thing. And I know I've used this reference before, but I, I can't help it. Every time I read it, I think about Elijah on Mount Carmel. And you get the prophets of Baal who go from like morning until afternoon. And their prayers get louder and louder. And they start dancing harder. And they start cutting themselves because they think, okay, Baal is certainly going to see us. If we're loud enough and we say enough things to him. And if we do enough things, we will finally convince Baal to do the good thing. Right? And that is sometimes how we live our lives with God. Trying to convince God to be good. But God is already good. Jesus says, don't be like that. Don't be like the Gentiles. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then Jesus will go into the Lord's Prayer after this. We're not going to look at it because otherwise we'd be here forever this morning. It says, don't be like them. Because they believe that they have to convince God or their gods or whoever they're praying to. They think they have to convince that deity to do the right thing, to do the good thing. And if they can just say enough prayers or they get enough people or they can have enough activity, their God will finally say, okay, you know what? I wasn't going to do it at first, but you've convinced me to do the right thing. Thank you. I'll, I'll go ahead and do the right thing now. Jesus says, you don't have to do all of that. Not when you know that your God is good. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be fearful about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear is, li is not life more than food and the body, more than clothing. Now, I will say this. Those things seem like things you should worry about. None of us here, none of us, I, I can almost guarantee it. None of us woke up this morning. Oh, man, I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. Now, there are some people that live like that, but I don't think we're here. You might be. We don't generally wake up and go, I don't know what I'm going to eat 
Or you wake up and say, I don't have a single stitch of clothing to put on. Those are things that if you didn't have them, you would worry about it. I can tell you those aren't things I worry about. I worry about a lot of stuff because I overthink a lot of things and I'm always kind of in this constant, like I know Jesus said not to worry, but here I am. Maybe you can relate to that. But I have never woken up and thought, I don't know what I'm going to eat today. And then said, but God knows I need food. He knows it. Even before I ask, he already knows. In other words, the things Jesus is telling them not to worry about or not to be fearful about are probably the very things that one would be very fearful about. Don't be fearful about your life. Look at the birds of the air. They neither soil nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of not of more value than they? God is good to the birds. Don't you believe he'll be good to you as well? So what are you so worried about all the time? It's because our deepest fear is that maybe God isn't good. And Jesus reminds them again and again and again in the Sermon on the Mount that God is always good. Always. And can any of you, by being fearful, add a single hour to the span of your life? No, but you can certainly take away some years. And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Flowers don't worry about things. They just don't. Birds are not fearful and fretting all the time. That's a very human endeavor. Birds go out and they just know it. They're going to find things to make nests. They know it's going to be there. They're going to find food to eat. They just know it. Woodpeckers, they know if they can just peck long enough, underneath that bark is some food they want to eat. They just know it. They don't wake up and go, oh man, I'm really worried, guys. Everybody gather around. Let's chirp about how worried we are. That's what we do. But Jesus says the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, they trust that God is good. And they go and they do their thing. And sure enough, they find their food. They build their shelters. They grow and they bloom and they flourish because God is always good. And even Solomon, with all the money and wealth that he had acquired, he still didn't look as good as that flower in the field. Therefore, do not fear, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. He already knows what you need. So we don't need to worry about it. We don't need to be so fearful about every decision that comes at us at life, thinking, will God be good if I choose door A or door B or door C? God will always be good. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And you have to understand, Jesus is talking to people. When he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, they had sometimes gone days without eating. And he'd say things to him like, you are blessed by God because you're poor. 
Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who hunger. Blessed are those who thirst. Don't worry about those things. And he's talking to people that might have gone one or two or even three days without anything to eat at all. Not like us, you guys. Most of you have probably had at least a cup of coffee. And some of you know, if you pay attention, that if, even if you didn't get a cup of coffee or half a donut, as <laughs> soon as church is over, it's right there, provided for, right? You're not worried about it. You probably already got plans for lunch. You might even do a little shopping after church or buy some new shoes that you want, which is all fine. And yet we still worry. The things we should worry about, maybe, Jesus says, don't even worry about that stuff. And we worry about all kinds of other things. And so we just want this knowledge. I call it, the, we want the God information, right? We want the divine instruction. But the reason we want divine instruction tells us, go down, choose door A. Do not choose door B. We want that because we, we actually think we can choose a door where God will say, oh, that's it. You went to the wrong college. There's nothing I can do for you now. Like, what do we think is going to happen? Oh, you moved to Tennessee? I can't do anything for you in Tennessee. You shouldn't have taken that job. You shouldn't have made that move. You shouldn't have been with that person. You shouldn't have had... Like, is that what we think? Because if it's not, then why are we always looking for all these signs? We want this knowledge, but the knowledge is, it's quite elusive as we have seen. The knowledge is elusive to find and God doesn't require our certainty. Certainty, that's for us. That makes us feel comfortable, right? But God doesn't require us to be certain about everything. And why? Because we trust that God is good all the time. And there's not a decision that we can make that will ever make God cease from being good. I was going to be good to you, but oh man, I can't be good to you anymore because you chose door B. He doesn't require our certainty. He desires our trust. You see, at the end of the day, and this is what I believe, and I, I, I think it's been kind of seen throughout this series we've been looking at at the end of the day we want all these signs we want all these directions we want we wish we had some tools like the urim and the thummim that would just tell us do this and not that or they're the ones at fault or they're the ones that did it and we want all this certainty because at the end of the day we think that we're in charge of what happens and we want to be in charge and we want to know everything and we want to know exactly how things are going to play out and we will do sometimes pretty strange things to try and determine what it is And I think what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount is, don't you trust that God is good? Because if you trust that God is good, you won't live in fear. And the thing that Jesus specifically brings up is fear of tomorrow. You won't always be so afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow. Because you know that God is good and you know that God is on your side. You know that God is with you. And no matter what you choose, God is there. Right now, all of you have multiple choices of things that you can do. I was just talking to my sister. She just, she just turned how old she is right now. I know how old she is, but I don't want to say it here. Because um, she's older than me. And she just took a new job.
She's older than me, and in the conversation she said, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what it is I want to do when I grow up. That's all of us. I don't care how old you are. We're all still trying to figure out what we're going to do when we grow up. Especially men, because we never grow up. But when you trust that God is good, you don't need to worry about what it is you're going to do when you grow up. See, God's less concerned about what decision we're going to make, and he's more concerned about how we're going to live and who we're going to be once we made that decision. Don't remember if you know if you remember the slide from last week. It says you can carry your cross down many paths. There's all kinds of things that we could do. We could stop going to this church and go to that church. Don't do it because that's door B and it's back, right? No. We have choices. We all have choices that we can make. And we make them every day. And as we're trying to find the will of God for our lives, I think oftentimes we're just, we're just asking the wrong question. Should I go down this path or that path? And I think God says, pick whatever path you want, but be my person on the path you pick. And God will be there. And I do want to say this too. I know we've been saying that we're not talking about moral choices, but don't be deceived and think, well, now, I'm not encouraging anyone to make a bad moral choice, right? But we do. I'm just recognizing a reality. We do. We oftentimes will do or say things that we know we shouldn't say or do. But even then, God has not abandoned you. There, again, there's nothing you can do that will cause God to cease being good. Now, does he want you to continue to make that choice day after day? No. But even when you make the wrong moral choice, God is still there. What can separate us from the love of God? Neither height nor depths, nor principalities, nor powers, nor demons. Paul says nothing. Not even you can separate yourself from the love of God. So trust that God is good. And don't worry so much about all the things that could happen. Because God is there. And God is good. Amen. We have one more week of this lesson series. We're going to take a look at the life of Job. Because I love Job and I can't get away from, I can't do a lesson like this and not bring Job into the picture. It's just not, a, it's just not possible for me. We're going to look at Job next Sunday and kind of focus on one of the ways that we think we know what God is up to. And how Job kind of says, actually, that's not the right way to do it. So we'll take a look at that next week. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to sing another song together. If you want to respond, if you want to say, you know, actually, I've, I've, I've been living my life as though God's not good all the time. And you just want some prayer. You just want to share that with someone. I'll, I'll be up here. Let's go ahead and sing this song again. We sung the song in the congregation.